Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I'm here today at RIA taking a look at an extremely cool pistol. This is a Chinese Type 64 silenced or suppressed pistol. Uh, it may look like a Makarov with a funky sort of silencer on it, but it's not. This is actually a mechanically totally unique, built from scratch, pistol design intended specifically to be a suppressed pistol. It has a lot of really cool elements to it. Now, uh, this was developed in 1964. It was first issued by the Chinese military, granted as a very specialized sort of item in very limited numbers. First issued in 1965, they were used in the Vietnam War, as far as we can tell. Um, and it actually only lasted a couple years before it was replaced by a different design, but we'll touch on that in a moment. Uh, to start with, it has a nine round single stack magazine, and it uses, interestingly, uh, basically 32 rimless, a 7.65 by 17 millimeter uh, cartridge, which is basically identical to the dimensions of 32 ACP. However, the 32 ACP is a semi-rimmed cartridge. It has just a little bit of a rim sticking out from the base of the case uh, that it uses to headspace. The cartridge that was designed for this takes that rim off, makes it completely rimless, headspace is on the mouth of the cartridge, as do all standard modern cartridges. Um, and really simplifies some of the mechanics involved. Uh, the 32 ACP is a dated cartridge. Now, ballistically, this is virtually identical to 32 ACP. It's uh, 74. It's a 74 grain bullet at 790 feet per second. Um, there was, if you read some of the the websites about this, they'll talk about how it was only effective to like 15 meters. There's a bit of a misunderstanding going on there. They, the Chinese, also did make a version of this cartridge with basically a frangible bullet in a plastic sabo, and that was intended for basically like airline security use, where you could fire it inside something like an airliner and not have to worry about it penetrating the skin of the aircraft, uh, or presumably going through a bad guy into a good guy. So there's a little confusion. That cartridge was used in this pistol, uh, but the standard ammunition was just as effective as 32 ACP, nothing like a 15 meter maximum range. Anyway, uh, I would like to definitely pull this apart and show you exactly how it works inside, because it's all totally unique, which is awesome. Seriously, this thing just looks incredibly cool. Whoever designed this had a fantastic aesthetic sense. So uh, a couple things to point out before we dig into the mechanics. The only markings on this are a serial number on the breech block and the frame. Um, this, I'm sure, serial number started at uh, 100,000, and this is gun number 67. I've seen a couple, and they pretty much all have like two and three digit serial numbers. They did not make many of these. There is also a serial number on the magazine, which doesn't quite match on this one. For controls, we have a manual safety right there, which is also going to lock the slide in place prevents the trigger from doing anything. Uh, with the safety disengaged, we have a double action uh, trigger pull. You can manually cock it there. You have just a little bit of an exposed nub of a hammer. Uh, the suppressor here has its main body in line with the barrel, of course, but then it also has the secondary expansion chamber under the barrel uh, to make it a little more quiet, to give it a little more volume, but that does not interfere with use of the sights. So you have sights set up right on top of the slide there, like so. Pretty typical sights. This configuration actually reminds me quite a lot of the very recently produced Silencer Co. Maxim 9, which has the same sort of idea um, in sort of an equally sci-fi but in a different way sort of look. In fact, a lot of elements of this pistol remind me of the Maxim 9. It's not mechanically the same, but a lot of the setup is similar, which I think is simply because the basic principles for developing an integrally silenced pistol um, hold, you know, are the same for both guns. All right, we have one more uh, control here, and that is this toggling switch in the breech block. And what this does, I'll show you how it works uh, in just a moment, but what this does is locks the breech block. Now it does it in an interesting way, where I can always cock the hammer there. No matter what I've done with this latch, I can always open the breech. However, it will only cycle when fired if it is in 
this position with a little A visible there. Um, if you put it over into this position on the right, uh, you can cycle it manually, but the gun will stay shut when it fires, which means uh, you don't have the action noise of that, which doesn't sound like a lot. But if that's the only thing that you're hearing, because 32 ACP is a very small volume case, and it's not going to produce all that much noise to begin with, and this suppressor is probably pretty effective at quieting it down, um, that leaves this action noise as a pretty substantial uh, thing. And so they wanted to have the option to lock the pistol. If you use that, of course, it means every time you fire you have to then manually rack the action to eject the spent case and load a new cartridge. But that's that's just the trade-off of having a suppressed pistol. Uh, we have a heel magazine release. This looks very much like a Makarov magazine, uh, but it is not quite directly interchangeable. We have a screw that holds the suppressor uh, assembly in place here, and I am actually going to screw that slightly in. There we go. That is a set screw, and when it's threaded out, it prevents this from moving, but when I screw it in, then I can unscrew this over the top of it. Uh, the trigger guard here does fold down once I've got this out of the way. All right, and then almost there. All right, then I can pull the suppressor off. So that is the actual barrel. It's it's only a three inch barrel in this thing. Uh, if we put the suppressor body lined back up, that's how far the barrel actually goes in the suppressor. Now we can take this all out, this stack of stuff. It's actually going to be easier to go from the front. The front section is threaded on. So here is our stack of baffling material. However, we have the secondary compartment down underneath. I can take out this plug. There we go. And down in there we have this interesting situation where there is a spacer that divides that chamber in half. So there's the separator plate. The top chamber above it just acts as more space uh, for the initial volume of gas. However, if we look at the front, there is a little vent port that runs down into the bottom, which is where gas comes into this metal mesh in the bottom chamber. So it's actually deliberately uh, split into two pieces, you know, for a good reason. And this acts to take the gas after it has gotten past the initial set of metal mesh, and then uh, once it gets to here it gives it just yet more space to go into to presumably attenuate the sound even more. Now if we take a look at this stack of uh, baffles and such, we have the threaded plug at the front. There is then a metal cap to line up this guy. We have a pair of rubber um, these are in fact rubber, rubber baffles. Whether these were originally wipes, I am not sure. Um, if they were, they've been fired enough that they have solid you know, holes through them. Although it's worth pointing out that these are not 32 caliber holes, so um, this will still seal around the bullet a little bit when you fire. There's another sort of alignment spacer at the back. And then we have see, this. Yeah, that that brass mesh is very tightly packed in there and doesn't want to come out. But what we have here is a big roll of brass mesh, which uh, will take a substantial amount of time for gas to infiltrate. This, this slows down a lot of the gas coming out of the pistol. This sort of mesh is uh, very common on early suppressor designs. If you look at the US M3 grease gun suppressor, that's how it works, and, and lots of other suppressors from the period. All right, that was the suppressor. How about the pistol itself? We will start by removing the recoil spring. So when I rack this, you'll notice there is a guide rod right up here above the chamber, um, also reminiscent of the Maxim 9. And to remove that, 
we have this screw, but it doesn't unscrew, you just push it in, rotate it 90 degrees, and it unlocks. And then you can see this, this plug right there is what would normally lock into that little socket. So we can pull that out, that's the recoil spring. Now the breech assembly, the bolt, will only come back to here and then it stops. And we actually have a little locking catch holding it in place. So what I need to do is take this screw, which also does not unscrew, it's just a spring-loaded lever basically, and what I want to do is rotate it forward about 45 degrees, and then... There we go. Then I can pop the breech block off. So what that screw is actually doing is taking the this sort of horseshoe shaped lug and rotating it forward like that. So when it's in the upward position it blocks the bolt from coming off the back of the gun, which is important when it's cycling, but I can hold it forward and that does allow the breech block to come off. So uh, the other elements in there are pretty simple. We just have the hammer right there. So this is hammer fired. Um, that's actually pretty much it. Uh, I should point out we have a pair of locking recesses right here. That is how the slide lock actually works. So what we have here is basically, well basically like an AK bolt. Um, we have this round lug on the stem of the bolt, and that is going to move and interact with this round track in the breech. So this, the bolt would actually be that direction. When the breech comes all the way forward, it forces this AK bolt to rotate. And when it rotates, those two lugs lock into position behind these two, or in these two recesses. That prevents the gun from cycling because the bolt's locked in the closed position. However, if you manually pull the breech block back, what you're going to do is use that cam pin. Sorry, I've got this upside down. That's how it ought to be. If you pull the bolt back manually, that cam pin will force the breech, the bolt, to rotate like that, and then it can cycle. So. That's what it's doing when you have it set to the slide locked closed position. Now if you switch this lever, what you're doing is basically locking off the back end of that cam track, which prevents the bolt from being able to rotate, which means that it stays in, uh, in an unlocked position, which means the pistol will cycle as a simple blowback. So, the confusing part here for some people, I think, is going to be the idea that this has locking lugs but it's a simple blowback. And that's because if the locking lugs have been engaged, the pistol does not cycle manually. They're literally there to lock the thing in the closed position and to not allow it to, to move. Now one might question whether this is actually, like, is this actually a more effective way to do this than just to, say, use this catch on the safety to lock the slide forward, because that's how a lot of other suppressed pistols have a, you know, a, a, a non-semi-auto, a manual operation mode. Just physically hold the slide shut and don't let it move. That would work just fine. The Chinese put a lot more engineering development into this concept in order to give it an automated sort of, you know, a mechanical locking system on the inside like this. I've reassembled the bolt back in there, and so when this is set to semi-auto mode, you can see that the locking lugs don't move. The bolt, the whole bolt head, the whole bolt itself doesn't move. If I flip this over, now you can see that the bolt is able to rotate down into those locking lugs. So in this position, if I pull this back, I'm using the breech block here to actually rotate the bolt before it can open, like that. If it's just back pressure, as in simple blowback handgun, um, pushing on the bolt, that doesn't cause it to rotate and so it won't cycle, even though I can manually cycle it very easily. Here's the Type 64, all field stripped. 
I think this is extremely cool uh, for the the complexity that went into its design that didn't really need to be there probably, and and we kind of see that with its replacement. All right, one last thing I want to show you guys is uh, the holster that came with this pistol. Uh, although holster is maybe a little generous, this is more like a belt attachment for the pistol, because this holster does not cover really anything important to the gun. So it leaves the trigger open, it leaves the muzzle open, it leaves the ejection port open. There's actually an ejection port cut into this holster. It has a clip so that you can actually carry the thing on a belt. Um, and it does cover the safety, so you can't activate the safety. But you could presumably leave this in double action mode, whip it off your belt, and fire the thing without having to take it out of the holster, which for a sneaky pistol like this is intended to be, um, that I suppose makes some sense for its application. But that's the, that's the holster uh, that it came in. As I mentioned earlier, this pistol was only used for a couple years before it was replaced. It was replaced by the Type 67. 1967. Uh, and basically what they did is they cut the weight almost in half. This thing uh, weighs like 1.8 kilo, it's about a four pound pistol. It's a very chunky, dense pistol. Uh, with the Type 67 they simplified a lot of things, they definitely simplified the suppressor. They certainly would have made it cheaper and easier to manufacture, and they also cut the weight down by about half a kilo, bringing it down to about 2.3 pounds or 1.3 kilos. So. Um, a lot of uh, some definite improvements. The Type 67 doesn't look as cool, it doesn't have kind of the swoopy sci-fi lines of the Type 64 here, but it does make a lot more sense. So uh, that is the story of an exceptionally cool pistol. I'm very happy to have gotten a chance to film this. You might wonder, by the way, how on earth does someone get one of these? Well the answer is you get this by being Mitch Warbell III, who is the guy uh, who founded Psionics and partnered up with Gordon Ingram to uh, make basically to make the Mac 10 a commercially successful enterprise. He is an extremely colorful character with all sorts of real and maybe fictitious exploits. Uh, but this pistol actually came out of uh, his family collection. Uh, he passed away actually, boy, like 35 years ago. Uh, but it would appear that uh, some of his guns have stayed in the family until just recently. So uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching.